Without further ado, Anand, uh, on behalf of the program committee, I would like to thank you very much for agreeing, agreeing to give this tutorial. I would like to welcome you to POTS, and now I will pass the stage to you, and please take control from here. All right, thank you, Yufei, and uh, thanks for the program committee for inviting me for this uh, great opportunity to speak to you. So the tutorial today will uh, basically have three components, and uh, in the first component, we'll talk about uh, the computational role of logic and particular how we can use it to systematically solve problems in the class NP and beyond NP, as you'll see. In the second part, we'll talk about how we can use logic to uh, learn from the combination of data and knowledge. And in the third part, we're going to talk about how we can use logic to do meta-reasoning, and particular reasoning about the behavior of machine learning systems. Now, everything we're going to be talking about today here is going to be contained in the sphere of propositional logic and will be based in particular about the theory of tractable Boolean circuits, which I've been working on for a while, even though uh, these uh, techniques that I'm going to be discussing have been used in a broader context, uh, for example, probabilistic programming and related areas as well. Since we're going to be talking a lot, what I'd like to do is basically in the next few slides, uh, have one slide on each one of these components to orient you about what is it that we will be uh, talking about and give you some kind of a roadmap. So in the first component, which will occupy about half the time of the tutorial because it's going to be build the foundations for the second and third parts as well, uh, we will talk about basically four different things. We'll talk about complexity classes that are of interest. And as you see, it's not just MP, but going beyond. We're going to see that problems from probabilistic reasoning and machine learning uh, are complete for these classes. So we're going to look at four particular ones. Each one is, particular for, uh, is complete for one of these classes. And then we'll see that actually the prototypical problems for these complexity classes that represent them end up being all actually uh, problems on Boolean formula. So we will go over these as well. And the idea is that I'm going to solve problems in these classes, particularly these ones that are representative of what a lot of people are, care about these days. What we're going to do is do reductions. We're going to reduce these problems to these corresponding uh, problems on Boolean formula. And the uh, basically crux of the discussion will be that, fine, we go and reduce these to these problems. How do we solve these? And this is where we're going to see a major component of this tutorial is that we can solve these prototypical problems for these classes, which all happen to be in Boolean formula using a very systematic approach, which is what's known as the knowledge compilation approach, where I compile these formulas into uh, tractable Boolean circuits. So these are Boolean circuits that satisfy certain properties. And depending on which properties they satisfy, then they allow us to solve, typically in linear time, uh, these corresponding problems. All right. So we will discuss these ingredients in this part of the tutorial. And in the second part of the tutorial, we'll talk about using logic for learning from a combination of data and knowledge. So typically, you have a problem that defines a space uh, over some variables. It's, as you see here in this table, uh, we call this a probability space. And you're trying to learn a distribution over that. But then you have background knowledge, which can be in the form of domain constraints, functional dependencies, and other types. And what that effectively does, it throws out part of the possibilities of your probability space. So you get something that we call a structured space, which is a subset uh, of the feasible states as defined by your background knowledge. And then you use data to learn distribution. And the idea is that if your structured space, which is defined by your background knowledge, is also captured by a tractable Boolean circuit, then that facilitates learning to a great degree. In fact, what you end up learning, as we will see, end up also being represented by a tractable circuit, but it's a probabilistic one, which you end up using for, for inference and so on. And in this component, we look at both supervised and unsupervised learning, and we'll see examples of how knowledge impacts things, like uh, the amount of data that you need. Of course, it reduces that, the robustness of your machine learning systems, and uh, so on. And as you see, this part builds on the first one. And in the third part of the tutorial, and that's the more recent. So by the way, the first component was more like last 20 years. The second component is more like the last six years. And this is more like the last couple of years. What we're interested here is we have machine learning systems 
uh, that get learned from data. So this could be Bayesian network classifiers, neural networks, random forests. And as you know, typically these are used basically as classifiers. They're functions. They take instances, map them to decisions, and people are interested in understanding the behavior of these boxes. Uh, they're interested in questions, uh, explaining their decisions, uh, quantifying their robustness, whether they give guarantees, are they making biased decisions, and so on. And the idea here is that what we'll do is uh, compile these boxes or their behavior into tractable circuits as well. So the tractable circuit will capture the input output behavior of these systems symbolically. And then we use this and the theory of tractable circuits to answer these kind of questions. And you'll see that basically we'll talk about all of these guys, uh, in some cases, restricted types like in your network. So it's uh, a lot of things we're going to talk about, exciting stuff. So let's get started with the first component, uh, which is basically logic for computation. And as I mentioned, we have these particular components. So what we're going to do is start with this guy here. We're going to introduce problems uh, that are complete for these classes. And then we'll go to problems that are prototypical for these classes. And then we talk about the reduction and finally the uh, discussion on tractable Boolean circuits. And I'm going to use this illustrative example for the queries I'm going to look at next. And what you see here is basically what is known as a Bayesian network. It's an example of more broadly what people call probabilistic graphical models. Uh, you have a a graph, which you can think of as a causal graph. It captures our perceptions of causality. We have a variable here, which is a condition or let's say a disease. We have two tests that bear on that disease. And one of them is also sensitive to gender. And we have this hypothetical variable for illustrative purposes, which says whether the two tests came out the same or not. And Beyond this causal graph or causal structure, then we have what people call the conditional probability tables. So if you look for T1, you'll see the table for T1 is here. And what that is doing is giving you the conditional probability on T1 given its direct causes, which is the condition. And this, for example, says uh, the probability that uh, the test will come out negative even though the uh, patient has the disease, that's 0.2. Uh, percent. So this is more like false negative in this case, and so on. So for T2, you'll see that that probability is conditioned on both the, the gender and the condition, and you'll see these properties. We call these parameters, these numbers. And if you look at this guy here, which is whether the test agreed or not, you're going to see all of the probabilities, zeros and ones. In fact, this is what you would call a functional dependency. So A functionally depends on T1 and T2. And uh, this network specifies a joint distribution over all of the variables. Uh, we're not going to mention how you get that, but then we're going to look at questions that are laid out here, MPE, MAR, MAP, and SDP. All of them are queries on a model like this or on a probabilistic distribution, and you'll see that they're complete for these corresponding classes. So we're going to go over these uh, next, and you're going to see later that we're going to be focusing more on this guy, which is the bread and butter of a lot of the computations in probabilistic reasoning and machine learning and so on. So let's uh, get started here. And the first query is what's known as the MPE or the most probable explanation. And uh, what you see here is I have a piece of evidence. I have an individual who did the tests and I'm telling you here that the two tests came out the same. And this is what this is indicating. And as you can see, there are four other variables and each one of them could be in two states. So there's basically 16 possible states for these variables. And I'm interested in the state that is most likely, right? So that's the MPE. And you can see the answer here. It happens to be a female that doesn't have the condition and on which the two tests came out negative. So it's an optimization problem. And uh, by the way, these are screenshots from a system called SAMIAM that was developed by my group and used widely. Uh, this is the MPE, it's pretty simple. And then, uh, as I mentioned, it's NP-complete. The decision version of this is NP-complete. And uh, the next query, which is called MAR or marginal probabilities, which is PP-complete, in this case, we're simply computing the marginals over the variables. And you can see these in these boxes here. So in this case, what I have is I, I'm telling you that the first test came out positive. The second test came out positive. Uh, what is the probability on the condition? What's the probability on being male or female? Uh, so these are the marginal probabilities, uh, your basic probability computation. 
And then we have two more. The next is uh, what is known as MAP. And that is complete for the class NP to the PP. MAP is actually a generalization of MPE. So it's also optimization. But if you remember in MPE, we tried to find the most likely state of all variables. In MAP, you get to choose. So in this case, you're choosing these two guys, uh, gender and uh, the condition, and you're trying to tell me what is the most likely state of these two variables. And as you can see here, uh, given that it's an individual who did the two tests and the two tests came out the same, the most likely situation is that it's a male that has, doesn't have the condition or the disease. So if you choose the map variables to be all of the variables, then you get the MPE as a special case. And interestingly enough, uh, optimizing over a subset of variables ends up being more difficult than optimizing over all of them in this particular case. And then we have one more query. Uh, so so this, the, the ones that I mentioned, the three uh, have been around for decades. So you see these in, for example, the Burl's book on Bayesian networks from the 80s, and they're used widely. The last one, uh, this version of it, uh, we introduced actually about 10 years ago, and it's called the same decision probability or SDP, but it's representative of competing expectations. So let, let me explain what that is. And, and, and again, this query is complete for the hardest class we're going to look at, which is uh, PP to the PP. Now, if you look on this side, you see a different Bayesian network. And as you know, these probabilistic models are usually used as classifiers. So in this case, I do have uh, features like scanning test, blood test, urine test. And I have a class variable, which is whether the patient is pregnant or not. And I'm trying to actually predict pregnancy. And the idea is uh, typically you have uh, some uh, values of these features and uh, that correspond to a particular instance. You compute a posterior on pregnancy and then usually check against the threshold. In this case, our threshold is 90%. And if you pass the threshold, then you will say positive decision otherwise not. So in this case, I do have uh, that the scanning test came out negative and the probability of pregnancy is only 40%. So it doesn't pass the threshold and the decision is no. So uh, what is the SDP query? The SDP query says, what is the probability that this decision or this classification will stick if I were to observe more features? And in this case, I'm interested in these features. And you have to specify what features you wanna do this expectation on. And if you can see from this window here, the SDP is this, that is there is a 78.7% .7 chance that this decision will stick even after you collect these two features. Uh, so you can think of it as a value of information kind of query. In fact, in the parts paper that goes with this tutorial, you see references of how people use this actually to do value of information on features and uh, so on. So, so these are basically our four queries that are complete for these classes. And they occupy a lot of the space about what people want to do, especially the marginal query. And what we'll do next is basically look at the counterparts, that is another set of four queries that are complete for these classes, except that these guys are the prototypical problems for these complexity classes. They are the representatives. And you'll see how simple they are. And uh, again, the idea is I want to eventually solve problems of these classes by reductions to these prototypical problems. And in fact, I'll show you a very specific reduction to one of them just to give you a sense of how uh, nice and efficient this can be. And as you see, some of these are well known, like SAT and so on. The other ones are a little bit less known. So let's get started with these guys. And here's the first query, which is SAT. And SAT is a Boolean formula. You have a Boolean formula like this. And as you know, if I have these three variables, A, B, C, then there is that many instantiations for these variables. And the question of SAT is, is one of these instantiations satisfying? Right? Can you find me a truth assignment that satisfies this formula, yes or no? And that's pretty simple. In this case, yes, this happens to be one of these guys. So that's sad, right? It's well known. It, it characterizes or a representative problem for the class MP. Now, the second one, which is mash sat, and this is the one that is complete for the class PP. Now what I want to do is not just only check whether there is a satisfying assignment, but in a sense, I want to know whether the majority of the assignments are satisfying. So it's like, I really need to count now. So this is also known as the counting class. And the answer in this case is no, because among the eight, there's only three guys that satisfy this formula. 
and that's less than a majority. So uh, later I'll tell you about variants of this that really gets used in practice. And here's two more, right? So the, the next two guys, by the way, that we're gonna do, uh, which are representative of the next complex classes, they require that we split the Boolean variables into two sets. So in this case, you can see the split here. I split the variables ABC into two sets. The first one is C and the other is AB, and, and here's how it goes. Uh, the question is, is there an instantiation of the X variables under which the majority of Y instantiation sets fine? So can you fix C to some value under which the majority of the instantiations of AB satisfy the formula. And in this case, the answer turns out to be yes, because if I fix C to false, then there are four instantiations for A and B under that, and three of them satisfy. So uh, the answer here is yes, all right? So look how this is kind of a, uh, a combination of the first two classes. I'm searching for an instantiation of these variables. So that's kind of the NP part. And if you give me one and say, is this the guy you're looking for? I have to solve a PP problem on that guy, uh, on these particular uh, variables. Again, the last thing is how simple these problems is, and they do characterize these complexity classes. And the last one you can probably expect, right? So this is known as match, match, sad. This is where you start doing expectations. And uh, the idea here is, is there a majority of the instantiations of variables X under which the majority of Y instantiations sits fine? So in this guy, I'm no longer just looking for one of these instantiations. I wanna check if the majority of these instantiations satisfy some property. And to check that property, I have to check the majority of instantiations there. So in this case, the answer is no, because if you fix true, if you fix C to true, you see that there are no satisfying assignments. Um, and if you fix it to false, there are a majority of satisfying assignments. But since I'm looking for a majority over these guys, this doesn't work in this case, and the answer is no. Uh, very simple problems, and it's nice that if we know how to tackle these guys through reductions, we can tackle this wide spectrum of things that appear in uh, probabilistic reasoning and machine learning. So what I wanna do next is show you two variants on the match set problem, uh, because these are very important in practice. In fact, the reduction is going to happen to one of them, uh, the representative reduction I'm going to show you. So we talked about MASHSAT, which was complete for the class PP, uh, and this variant is known as model counting or sharp SAT. It's pretty simple. So in MASHSAT, the idea was it was a decision problem. Uh, are the majority of instantiations sets fine? And here I want you to count them. I want a number. So this is like the functional version of it. So I want you to come back with the number three. And again, this is not as sharp set, but the more interesting one practically is another variant on this, which is known as weighted model counting or WMC. And uh, that's gonna be what we'll focus more on later. So in this case, what you do is you have weights attached to these worlds. And what I want you to do is not just count the satisfying assignments, I want you to add up their weights. So in this particular case, this is the weight that you get the interesting thing here is like, where do I get these weights? Because I have an exponential number of worlds. So how do I specify these? Well, the way this works is you specify these by in including a weight for every literal, for every variable of negation. So for the variable A, there is a weight WA. For the variable not A, there is a, a weight. And the weight of a world is simply the product of the weights of the literals that correspond to that world, right? So if you look here, this last uh, world here is A, B, and C are all false, so I will use these weights for that. So this way you can use a linear number of weights. So basically in this weighted model accounting, you have a Boolean formula plus uh, basically weights that define the problem and we'll see that one of the reduction that we will look at actually next is reducing to weighted model counting. All right. So what we have is these complexity classes, a rich set of classes contains a lot of interesting problems. Uh, we've looked at some of them from probabilistic reasoning and machine learning. Uh, they're all complete hardest for their classes. And then we looked at the prototypical ones, which are all questions on Boolean formulas. And what I wanna do next is basically show you one of these reductions. And in particular, we're gonna look at this guy here. 
And we're going to see how we can reduce mark to weighted model count. And just to give you a sense of how the two worlds get connected, because people say, you know, probabilistic reason, it's all numbers. And, and how are you going to solve this using only symbolic manipulations? Well, that's the magic here. And, and we'll see how this works. So let me show you this uh, reduction. This reduction is actually is the very first uh, that was proposed. I did propose this, what, about now 20 years ago. There was more reductions and more sophisticated ones, but uh, this gives you the gist of what's going on. So what I have here is a Bayesian network with A, B, C, all of them are binary. And uh, as we've seen earlier, to finish the specification of the Bayesian network, you have to give you these parameters, these probabilities, which effectively, uh, in this case, give you the distribution over B conditioned on the state of A. So you see here two distribution, uh, one for B conditioned on A being true, one for B on A con conditioned on A being false. And similarly for this guy, and then you have a distribution over uh, this guy. So I have 10 parameters in this case. And the distribution that is specified by the Bayesian network looks like this. Uh, I'm not going to tell you why, but I'll just tell you a, a simple observation about it. So this is the variables ABC. These are all of the instantiations. And as you can see, for the probability of each instantiation happens to be the product of three parameters. And one parameter for each variable. So if you look at this guy, for example, the third one, uh, we're multiplying the probability for A by the probability for not B given A by the probability of C given A. The three that you choose depend on the instantiation of the variables in that world. So you're pulling a number from each one of these guys. Uh, again, we'll have to talk about Bayesian networks, tell you why is that the case, but that doesn't matter for our discussion here. What I want to do is, show you how I can compute probabilities with respect to this Bayesian network, compute marginals uh, by reduction to uh, weighted model counting. What you already kind of start to see here, because you can think of these as the weights and so on. So uh, I, I need to write a Boolean formula together with weights that solves this problem. And uh, it turns out to be pretty simple. The real interesting concept here is that for each one of these uh, parameters, which is a number, a real number, I'm going to introduce a corresponding Boolean variable. So for this guy here, I'm going to introduce the Boolean variable P, B sub A. And the idea here is that this Boolean variable is going to represent or capture the presence or not presence of a particular parameter in the world. So if you look at this world, these three parameters are present and the other guys are not present, the other seven. And the Boolean formula we are going to write will end up having exactly eight models, eight satisfying assignments that correspond to these guys. And in each satisfying assignment, uh, the variables that correspond to the present uh, parameters like these will appear positively and the others will appear negatively. Let's see, it's actually simpler than what it's sounding now. Here's, here's basically how it looks. Uh, let me get rid of this guy here. Uh, now, what you see here is for every variable, I went and wrote a bunch of Boolean statements and they have a very simple structure. Uh, if you look at this variable B, its parent is A. So I look at every possible instantiations of these variables. And for each instantiation, I had an equivalence with the corresponding parameter, All right? Very regular structure. If you look here, A, there's no parents. So A and not A, if and only if the corresponding. And the idea is, if A is true and B is true, I want the parameter that looks like this to be present. And if this parameter is present, that means that A is true and B is true. Simple. At least I hope you can see how easy it is to generate this uh, Boolean formula from a Bayesian network and it's actually pretty uh, uh, efficient. And now I need to specify weights that go with this Boolean formula. And that turns out to be pretty simple. All of the variables in the Bayesian network, whether appearing positively or negative, will get a weight of one. Uh, for these guys that I introduced, the negative literals have a value of one. So the only guys that get real weights are the positive literals of that, that particular form. And the weights here are basically the probabilities that come from the Bayesian network, all right? So this is pretty simple. And as I mentioned, uh, guaranteed, this Boolean formula will have exactly eight models. And here, let's look at one of them. So this is one of them. And look what are the variables. So this correspond to what? True, true, and false. So this correspond to this guy here. And look what happens. You've got A, B, and C not true. Now look at these variables. They all appear positively. And these are the guys that correspond to these parameters here. 
and all of the other guys appear negatively. So I capture the fact that when my variable instantiation is this way, these are the parameters that define my probability and these define my. Now remember, all of these guys have a weight of one. All of these guys have a weight of one. The only guys that have real weights are these. So the weight of this model is simply this, which is precisely what I want here, all right? It's pretty simple uh, encoding in this particular case. And uh, now that I have this guy, if you want to compute the probability of some event, let's say small delta, that is simply the weighted model count of big delta and small delta. Big delta here is, is the encoding, is uh, these guys, these three guys here and here. Uh, so, pretty simple. You take a, a processing graphic model, you write a Boolean formula, you define the weights, and if you know how to do weighted model counting on that Boolean formula, you're pretty much uh, done in this particular uh, case. So, this is the encoding, and, and this is actually a very simple uh, kind of encoding. And uh, there are more sophisticated ones that can take advantage of which values you may have for some of these parameters. So if you have background knowledge that tells you, I know the value of some of the parameters to be zero or one, then basically you can actually take advantage of that and generate encodings that end up being efficient when you do the reasoning on them. And the parts paper that goes with this story actually give you citations for or references for more sophisticated encodings. And just to give you an example, this could be very competitive, this way of model counting approach. Uh, this is one of these results from one of the uh, UAI competitions on problems that were encoded from relational Bayesian networks. They have a lot of uh, logical constraints and you can see the system that is based on what I mentioned to you basically solved all of these problems and other systems did not. And these kind of uh, reduction based uh, approaches are also now common actually in probabilistic programming and so on. So now I wanna to get to the last part, which is the core of what's hap gonna happen computationally, which is this discussion on tractable Boolean circuits. So as we've seen so far, I have problems here that I'm interested in. There are prototypical problems for these complexity classes that are all on Boolean formula. I, I know how to reduce from this to that. Now I wanna solve these guys. I wanna solve them in a systematic way. And the systematic way of solving these is to compile the Boolean formula into circuits that have certain properties. And as you'll see, depending on which property I have, then I will be able to solve problems in these classes. So we need to talk now about tractable circuits. And here's how the picture looks like. Boolean formula gets compiled into a circuit. And depending on the properties on that circuit, I can now go and answer one of these queries. Uh, typically, well, in, in generally in polynomial time, but everything we're going to talk about is going to be actually linear time, linear time on this guy. So if this, this is the, the this is the computational engine the compilation, and if that succeeds, you're in heaven. Now, when you put properties on these circuits, they end up getting names. So there is actually quite a bit of these, but we're going to look at four of them next. Uh, which is going to be the focus of what we're going to be discussing in the second parts and so on. Three types of, uh, four types of circuits. So let's get started. Now, all of our discussion will be on negation normal form circuits and what's known as NNF circuits. And these are circuits that have two types of gates, ANDs and ORs. They can have inverters as well, but the inverters can only appear next to the inputs. So you cannot have an inverter following an AND and or an OR. So it's typically inputs potentially inverted, and then you have layers of ANDs and OR gates. Uh, those are by themselves not interesting, but we'll see that once you start imposing properties on, on them, they become interesting. So let's look at the simplest and the first property, which basically allows to do SAT in linear time and unlocks the class of NP. So what is this property of decomposability? It concerns AND gates in the circuit. So if you look at this particular AND gate here, uh, and you look at the subcircuits that feed into it, you will see that these two subcircuits do not share variables. So in this here, I have LK, and in this case, I have PA, and they do not overlap. Now, this has to apply for every AND gate in the circuit. So if you look at this AND gate, you'll find that it's also have this property. If you look at this guy here, it also has that property and so on. And if a circuit satisfies this property, if a negation normal form circuit satisfies the composability, it's known as a DNNF circuit. And as I mentioned, SAT becomes linear on this guy. You can check the satisfiability 
in fact, using simple paths. Let's, let's look at why, why this happens. Well, here's the thing. Let's, let's look at this from a Boolean function kind of decomposition. Uh, this is gonna be a running example. I have a function over four variables, A, B, C, D. And look how I rewrote this function. I wrote it as a disjunction of three components. And each component I broke down into two subfunctions, uh, G1 over A, B and H1 over C, D. And look that the variables do not overlap. So for G1 and H1, they do not overlap. So think of this as an OR gate that has three children. And each child is an AND gate with two children, right? If you look at the second component, again, the G and H do not overlap. If you look at the last guy here, G3 and H3 do not overlap as well. And so this is decomposable. And look now, if I want to do the satisfiability, what is the satisfiability of F? I can now break it down into questions about satisfiability of this component. In fact, this function is satisfiable if and only if the following. If uh, sat uh, G1 and sat H1 or this or that. Now, the fact that you can decompose the satisfiability question of F into these three guys, into a disjunction that you can always do. But the fact that you can decompose the satisfiability of this into these two guys into two independent satisfiability tests that is only possible because G1 and H1 do not share variables. All right, so it enables this breakdown here. And as you can see from this, if I apply this uh, identity recursively, you can see why you can do weighted model counting, uh, why you can do satisfiability, sorry, on these sets in linear time. It's actually a single pass, and this is the secret here is to be able to reduce the satisfiability of this expression to two independent tests. And once more, it's because these two components do not share variables. So just being able to take a negation normal form and turn it into one that is decomposable where the subcircuits feeding into AND gates do not share variables, that basically unlocks AND. And next we're gonna see another property which is called determinism that basically allow you to count and do weighted model counting in linear time on these circuits. And this is a, a simple property as well. There's two ways to describe it. One of them is by looking at OR gates. So it is a property of OR gates. So if you look at this OR gate and look at the inputs and let's call them uh, alpha one and alpha two and alpha three, what this property says is that uh, these have to be mutually exclusive. So alpha one and alpha two cannot uh, overlap. They, they must be mutually inconsistent. And similarly for alpha 1 and alpha 3 and alpha 2 and alpha 3. And that, what that means basically is that if you evaluate the circuit under any input, in this case we're evaluating it under this input, so red means high and blue means low. If you evaluate the circuit under this input and you examine every OR gate, you're going to see that there is at most one high input. So in this thing here, I have only one high input. Uh, only one high input and here no high inputs. So you could have no high inputs, but at most one, but you will never have two or more inputs to an OR gate that are turned on at the same time. So this is determinism, but it's mutual exclusiveness. And if you have determinism and decomposability, then you can basically do counting in linear time. And, and let's see why quickly before we take a look at an example. We have this function f that I decomposed into these components. It is decomposable. And let me call the, the components f1, f2, and 3. So if, if you have determinism, that means these guys are mutually exclusive, right? They do not overlap. So what does that mean? That means if you want to count how many satisfying assignment this f has, now you can break it into counting how many truth assignments f1 have plus how many F2 has, plus how many F3 has. You couldn't do this otherwise. You couldn't break down the model counts into three different components if you didn't have determinism. And look what we get now. So I'm trying to count the models or satisfying assignment of F, and I, I broke it down into each one of these. And since I have decomposability, since G1 and H1 do not share variables, I can further break down the satisfiability of F1 into a product. So here you're seeing the composability and determinism break work together. The model counts of F1 end up being this product because I have decomposability, because G1 and H1 do not share variables. 
And the fact that I can add up these guys, you get it from the terminism. And now you can see how this identity allow you to do counting in linear time. There is another property called smoothness. It's not hard to enforce at most quadratic time, but the quadratic complexity and even recent work by a group from UCLA and UW showed that you can even do more efficiently. I'm gonna skip it, but you need this for what's gonna happen next. Uh, here's more the company. Uh, now, this circuit is both decomposable and deterministic. And uh, let's see how we can count satisfying assignments using a linear path through it. It's, it's pretty simple. You assign a weight of one to every input literal, whether it is a positive literal or a negative literal. And you simply push these numbers upwards uh, by adding at OR nodes and multiplying at N nodes. So here, the first layer, I went and did additions on these OR nodes, and now I'm multiplying uh, the inputs and I'm getting these numbers. And then you go ahead and basically do an addition again, multiplication, addition, and you get the number nine. That's it. That's basically it. And uh, this tells you that this circuit has nine satisfying assignments. So I can do shop set on this basically using a forward pass on this particular circuit. And um, in fact, you can also do something more interesting, which is marginal counts. What does that mean? So uh, the circuit has nine satisfying assignments, but now I want to know how many of them have A true and uh, K false. This is what we would call a marginal count. And the same procedure, except that for those inputs that conflict with this, I will give them zeros instead, all right? And these are all highlighted in blue. And then I will do the counting again. And then I'm going to get the number two. That means even though the circuit has nine satisfying assignments, only two of them set A to true and K to false. And this is important because you see this will allow us to do uh, marginal probabilities. In fact, you can do weighted model counting also. Uh, but instead of passing one and zero uh, inputs, you end up passing weights. All right, so you can see what we're doing here. We're replacing the literals by their weights. And uh, if you're just counting the do, doing weighted model count, just forward pass. If you want to compute uh, a marginal uh, weighted model counts, similarly, uh, you replace some of these weights by zeros, uh, as we've seen in the previous slide. Now, let me um, show you something here. What we did is we multiplied at and nodes and we did additions on OR nodes, right? And you can think of this as a computation graph in a way. In fact, I can get rid of these uh, Boolean gates now and look at this graph. And this is known as an arithmetic circuit. And it's basically a circuit with multiplication and additions that does with model counting for me and uh, marginal weighted model counting, so I can use it to do complete marginal probabilities based on the reduction that I showed earlier. Uh, these were introduced uh, in two ways earlier. Uh, the way I showed you here is a construction method for how do you compile a Bayesian network or a graphical model into an arithmetic circuit that does computations on that uh, model in linear time. Uh, these circuits have been defined in this work also independently of this construction method. So uh, there are multiple views on these circuits, but the end result for us, if you want to look at it from a systems point of view, you're basically taking a Bayesian network and uh, combining it into an arithmetic circuit or what's known as an AC, which uh, does this computation. And you can see what's going on here. You're doing weighted model counting. And the crux of this computation really is this ability to take a Boolean formula and compile it into a circuit, Boolean circuit that has the right properties, decomposability and determinism. And realize also that you can still talk about the properties of decomposability, determinism and other ones on this guy, right? You know, you can think of these as ands, you can think of these as ors, and I haven't lost track of the variables. And there is another life on these circuits that, that does that uh, as well. All right, folks, so let's see. I need two more properties before I can wrap up this section. And we're a bit uh, running out of time here. So let me try to wrap up this quickly. So, so what's gonna happen next is we're gonna strengthen the property of decomposability and we're gonna strengthen the property of determinism to get yet another circuit type that we will use in the other parts. 
And the uh, basic idea of uh, structure decomposability is that when I do the uh, decomposition here, I want the split of the variables between G and H to be always the same. So in this case, it wasn't always the same. I split the variables differently across each component, but in this case, they're all the same. And this is what I call structure decomposability. And the, the way this works is, I will basically have to specify how you want to do the variable splits. And this is done using something known as uh, V-tree. So the V-tree is a, is a binary tree whose leaves are in one-to-one -one correspondence to my circuit variables. And you can think of this as a recipe for how to do the variable splitting when you're decomposing. So if you look at this circuit, it conforms to this tree in the following sense. If you look at this end node here, it conforms to this root, which means that these sub-circuits, uh, one of them has the variables LK, which is in the left subtree here, and the other guy has the variables, which is in the right subtree uh, here. And this applies to the other end gates. Now, decomposability in general does not require that. It does not require that these three gates have to split their variables the same way, but structured decomposability require that. And uh, you can basically go to the next level. So you'll see these AND gates conform to this node. They split their variables this way and so on. So uh, when you're doing structured decomposability, you have to have a V3, which is, uh, specifies how you split your variables. And the size of the circuit end up being sensitive to what kind of V3 do you use. And part of compilation is to search for a good uh, V3. So one more property, partition determinism, which is a strengthening of this property. And then we have our last circuit type and we can wrap up this component of the tutorial. So partition determinism ended up being influential because it teaches those circuit types that uh, got actually used quite extensively in, in learning uh, later. And I'm gonna illustrate this by a concrete example. It, what you have here is this function f and here's it's broken into three components. It's this junction of f1, f2, f3. And I'm gonna rewrite it like this. All right, so what I'm doing here is structure decomposability. I split my variables this way. So if you look at the decomposition, I have these G1, H1, da, da, da. And you can see that the split is always, the Gs are over these variables and the Hs are over those variables. And it happens that this is now deterministic as well. But actually I'm getting determinism in a very specific way. That is, if you look at these Gs, they are actually mutually exclusive and exhaustive. That is, they satisfy this property. Every pair of them is mutually exclusive. And if you take the, the junction, you get through. So they represent a partition. So I'm getting determinism, but in a very specific way. I'm getting determinism in a somewhat uh, strong way by ensuring that the G components form a partition. And uh, that turns out to be very interesting, as you will see visually. So let's look at the circuit, which actually satisfies this property. And let, let's look at this fragment of it. And, and this fragment, which is an or and three children are ands. Think of this as what we just looked at. So this is F, and I decomposed it this way. And you will see that in this case, uh, regardless of how you evaluate the circuit, for any input, and I'm using one of them here, you're going to find precisely one of the G1, G2, and G3 will be on and the other two will be off. In this case, it's this guy that's on and the other two guys are off. So what's happening here is you can think of this fragment as being like a multiplexer, which is selecting to pass through either the value of H1, H2, or H3. In this case, we're passing the value of H2. Uh, if this was the guy was on, the other two will be off and I'm passing that guy. Uh, this is why these are called decision diagrams, because you can think of this node as making a decision, which one of these to pass. And that's why they're called sentential, because the decision on whether to pass H1 or H2 or H3 it depends on whether this sentence or this circuit evaluates through which one of them. Uh, this is to be contrasted with binary decision diagram. I'm gonna show you this next, which is a special case of what you have here. But the bottom line is, if you have an SDD circuit, sentential decision diagram, uh, and these are structured also, and you use an appropriate V3, you can also so solve now match match sat in linear time. Okay, remember our four complexity classes. The, the most difficult one was the PP to the PP. 
And if you take your Boolean formula and can compile it into a circuit of this type with an appropriate V tree, now you can solve measurements that, that is compute expectations in linear time on the circuit size. This is a relatively more recent result. So basically, I showed you enough circuit types to uh, capture those complexity classes. I skipped the image sad, but you can check the paper on another circuit type called decision DNNF, which allows you to do these in linear time. But the, 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 the main point, guys, is that everything now is about taking a Boolean formula and building a Boolean circuit, NNF circuit that has the right properties. We have squeezed all of the computational needs into that compilation process. Uh, one word on the connection between this and OBDDs, people, these are very famous, ordered binary decision diagrams. They look like this. Uh, they're like decision trees, except they're graphs, and they're also ordered in the sense that the variables are always tested in the same order, uh, regardless of how you traverse from the top to the bottom. And people see them this way, but actually they are a special case of what I just showed you. If you look at that decision node in, in the OBDB and the two children, you can think of this as this kind of a circuit fragment. That is, I am testing X, and if X is true, I'm passing this. If X is false, I'm passing that. If you take this guy, and repeatedly replace nodes with these fragments, you're gonna get an SDD circuit. Except that this SDD circuit, whenever you're making a decision, it's always gonna be uh, by testing on a variable of its negation. And in fact, if you build a, an SDD using a particular V3 that looks like this, it's called the right linear V3, you're gonna get a, an OBD as a special case. So you, you can read more uh, on the connection. Uh, but you'll find that this notion of partition determinism that I mentioned end up reducing to what's known as Shannon expansion. And by the way, SDDs are exponentially more succinct than uh, OBD as also shown. What I just discussed, and I need to wrap this up now in a, in a minute, is studied in AI under the label of the knowledge compilation, the area of knowledge compilation. And this discussion that we had about circuit types and what you can do with them happens under what's known as knowledge compilation map, where you look at circuits and their properties and people studying them from two angles. Uh, one angle is what kind of queries become tractable on these circuits under different properties. And then what happens to the succinctness of these circuits? How are their relative sizes? So the very first knowledge compilation map was actually from about 20 years ago, but there's been a lot of development since then. In fact, just last December, there was a tutorial or a workshop in France where uh, an up-to-date tutorial was given on knowledge compilation, I, a couple of hours dedicated just to this. There's a reference for that and the slides in your paper. And these actually slides come from that, showing you various uh, latest succinctness results and so on. And, and you can see the past paper for more. There was also a lot of interactions with other areas over the years you'll see this knowledge compilation meets X. Actually, Dan Sushi was one of the first to observe connections with database theory and had this initial influential paper. And then there was a lot of follow-up work after that. And you'll see also connections to communication complexity and, and, and so on. And some of these circuits now being studied by theory folks, their, their properties and so on. You're probably wondering, how do you compile these Boolean formulas into these circuits? Uh, this is a subject on its own, would require its own tutorial. I'm just going to say that you have two, two approaches, what we call bottom-up and top-down. Uh, the bottom-up approaches roughly compile small pieces and then combine them together. Uh, they're based on what uh, originally Brian did in his influential paper on OBDDs. You can do the same for SDDs. In fact, on my YouTube channel, there is a tutorial on this that you can watch. And the other way is to do it top-down. And the basic idea here is that you use exhaustive algorithms, search algorithms like people use in model counting, but you keep a trace of what you're doing. You keep a trace of where the search is going and that trace ends up being a circuit. So this is the paper that shows the foundation of this approach, showing basically that the trace of different search algorithms correspond to different circuit types. So you will need to follow up on this after that. Let me see here. I will have to skip this part and move to the second component. Actually, let me do it. Uh, there is a discussion here on another type of circuits beyond ACs known as SPNs. The bottom line here is that it turns out that if you drop determinism 
and you get something known as SPNs, you will get the circuit to still compute marginal probabilities correctly, but not for this Bayesian network, for some other distribution. And in this line of work where people propose this idea, I'm not using the SPNs to compile from a Bayesian network, but I'm trying to do that to learn directly from data. So in this line of work, which started here, the idea was, why should I learn a Bayesian network and then compile it to a circuit and then to a circuit? If this guy is so nice, why don't I learn this directly from data and cut that process? And it turns out that in this case, you can weaken one of these properties and get circuits that still do interesting things, and those are known as SPNs. Now, there is a lot of mystery surrounding that, but I will leave that to you for this paper, which relatively recent, that addresses questions, how can you actually compute marginals without determinism? It's really an interesting story, but I'll leave it for you to follow up on later. And if you're into videos on my YouTube channel, there is a lecture in one of my classes but now I want to move to the second part, which I have to trim a little bit to focus on the very last part because we're running out of time. So in this second part, which will be relatively short, we're going to see how we can learn from a combination from knowledge and data. So first, let's motivate. What do we mean by knowledge? Here's an example of a situation where I have a department that's offering four courses. I have logic, uh, knowledge representation probability, and AI, and I have data where each record here tells me what students have done. There are six students that did this, 54 students did that. And what I want to do is learn a distribution from this data that I can use to reason about the behavior of these students. This is a classical problem. Uh, the, the one exception here is I have additional information. Uh, I have these that tell me about prerequisites and what people can do or not do. So everyone must take at least one of probability or logic. Probability is a prerequisite for AI and so on. And you can express these using these logical constraints. And I want to learn from both this and that. The, the fact is that this knowledge tells me that there are certain things that are impossible. And the fact that you're not seeing them in the, in the data is not that they're unlikely, they're just not possible. And then I want to learn from both of them. The way that you can do this, and the way this was proposed about six years ago was, let me do this. I will take my logical constraints and I will compile them into a circuit of appropriate type. And the, the choice here for reasons that you'll see in the citation was that I'm, I'm going to compile them into SDD circuits. And now the circuit itself, which is tractable, capture my background knowledge. In what sense? In the sense that if you give me any combination of what students did and you evaluate the circuit, if you get a one here, that means that's legitimate. If you get a zero at the output, that means, no, this is not allowed by background knowledge. So the circuit now is defining your space of feasible world states. But I want to induce a distribution over that. I want to learn a distribution over that. And, and these circuits end up being very nicely uh, behaved in the sense that you can induce a distribution over the satisfying assignments of the, uh, the circuit by simply throwing local distributions on OR gates. So for every OR gate, all I need is a distribution over the inputs of that OR gate. And these distributions are independent, so you can assign them independently. You just want to make sure that the numbers that tag the inputs to an OR gate add up to one. And it turns out that this annotation, it does induce a distribution that is extremely well behaved, as we see. In fact, you can estimate these parameters from data, complete data in a closed form, a maximum likelihood parameter estimates. So you could put these numbers in various ways, but there is one set of parameters that actually give you the maximizing property of the data and, and those can be obtained in, in closed form. And this is what's known as a probabilistic SDD. Uh, it has very nice compositional semantics in the sense that the whole circuit with these numbers specify a distribution and you will see that those uh, uh, configurations that are incompatible with your background knowledge have zero probabilities and the others have probabilities attached to them. In fact, every sub-circuit here has its own uh, distribution. Uh, the distributions induced by uh, these PSDDs uh, will always be normalized as long as your local distributions are normalized. They have other properties for example, it is a complete representation. Any distribution can be represented in this fashion. 
these circuits are tractable for computing MPE and marginals and, and so on. So the basic idea is you take back the knowledge, compile it to an SDD circuit, and then learn the parameters of the SDD circuit from data to get a PSDD, which basically gives you this uh, distribution over the feasible state. And it turns out that this is actually pretty uh, broadly used beyond this. Uh, and I'll show you just quickly uh, how you can use this to induce distributions with combinatorial objects. I'd have to mention this briefly and point you to other places, but I'm gonna show you like a major application for this. And what you will see here is we can use this approach to systematically learn distributions over combinatorial objects. Um, and, and the example here is from routes. So you have this uh, uh, map, let's say, and you have a source and destination and you have ways to go between them. And what you can do is try to represent uh, these routes using truth assignments by having a variable, a Boolean variable for every edge. And then if the variable is turned on or off, that represents a route. Well, that doesn't really work in general because look at this variable assignment here. That does not correspond to a route because it's not connected, right? So these are my variables, each one of them on, off, part of the route or not. And this is a route, this is not a route. What, what you can do is you can route a Boolean formula over these variables it, whose satisfying assignments are precisely the routes that you care about. And they may satisfy additional properties that they're simple, no loops, and so on. Now, if you take that Boolean formula whose satisfying assignments correspond to your combinatorial objects and compile it into an SDD, then the tractable circuit has captured basically the space of your combinatorial objects. Now you're in business if, you, if, this, if the compilation succeeds because now you can have like GPS data on actual routes and train the parameters of the SDD to get a PSDD which gives you route distributions. This is not just a hypothetical exercise. I'll show you in just a little bit that it's been used actually at scale. In this application, you actually have real maps and you basically then have GPS data and you use the technique that I mentioned to actually learn distributions over routes, which you can then use to do various things, like you're seeing here, estimate traffic, predict routes, and, and so on. Actually, we were able to compile maps in this particular case uh, for uh, San Francisco, had that many nodes, that many edges. Now that's pretty significant. And again, the map was compiled into an SDD, and then there was GPS data that was used to actually learn the parameters of the SDDs to get the PSDD. The final PSDDs had millions of nodes. And then you could use it to do, for example, two kind of things. You can now look at routes between places and, and use the specific routes to identify the type of drivers. It was also used to do route completion. So I can give you a partial uh, route and I see how, what is the most likely way it will be completed. And you'll see in the papers that are uh, referenced in the pods paper, the citations to these. Uh, I have to say that for this particular application, to scale to this level, there were other ideas. I'm just gonna flash them quickly next because I wanna have a couple of slides on supervised learning. But to actually able to compile maps of the size, there was this notion of a hierarchical map where you uh, try to partition the map into regions. And uh, that also required introducing a new type of circuits known as conditional PSDDs, which were utilized in this particular context. But we don't have time to go over this, except again to say that uh, this notion that your background knowledge could be the description of combinatorial objects is pretty interesting. And, and this approach allow you to systematically learn and read them with distributions over combinatorial objects. And you'll see this particular application as one of these major illustrations. I want to end this part by just a couple of slides quickly on very, very recent work, which is on supervised learning. All of this that I discussed so far is unsupervised learning. So the data is unlabeled. But you can also compile and train circuits in a supervised fashion. In fact, this happens to be one of my current passions so if, if you look at a Bayesian network like this, we've seen how you can compile a circuit that allows you to answer various queries on this. But you can be more specific. You can say that, look, I'm going to always observe the value of A and C. And when I do, 
I want to go and compute the property of B. So I'm interested in this particular query. So in that case, you can basically compile an arithmetic circuit that is dedicated for that query. So the output of this is the uh, marginal distribution over the variable B and the inputs are the evidence. And then I want to learn these weights. These happen to be uh, the parameters that come from the Bayesian network that I want to train. And, and you can train these from labeled data using gradient descent. I mean, this now looks like a neural network, right? And uh, I give you labeled data input output, and you can train your gradient descent. Now, the, the, the benefit though, and I'll show you some numbers next, is that now you can integrate background knowledge in the form of independence as shown here, because this circuit depends on that network logical constraints, functional dependencies. In fact, in this uh, recent paper, I'll show you up here this summer, you can show that functional dependency actually can even facilitate this compilation process to make it feasible. The point is all of these mean that some of these will be known. So I don't have to learn them. And because what I'm learning is so heavily influenced by background knowledge, it can behave significantly better than normal. So let, let me show you, uh, uh, these simple experiments. This is very fresh to show you how promising it is to do this notion of supervised learning with background knowledge. And this application, what we did is uh, look at uh, simple shapes in images, uh, in this case, rectangles or these seven segment digits uh, with noise. And the idea is I wanted to look at this and say, this is a tall rectangle or a wide one, or its height is this. You want to predict properties of the rectangle, and here you want to recognize the, the digits. So you can do this in two ways, right? Uh, you could do like a CNN, uh, a convolution neural network, which will do pretty well on these things. Or you can do it, as we were just discussing, you build a model, generative model for these shapes. This is the model for generating rectangles. A rectangle has a height, has a width, it has a shape. Uh, this is whether it renders in a particular row, whether it renders in a particular column, whether it renders in a particular pixel. These are the row and column for the upper left corner. And in fact, in this model, there, you'll have functional dependency. Uh, row is, is functionally dependent on these guys and column on those guys. Now, you can take this and say, here's my input, the pixels. I want to predict the shape. And I can generate an AC for you that does that. And then you can train it train its parameters from labeled data, uh, which is labeled images. And here's the thing. In, in this experiment, I'm going to show two of them. We compared with, with neural networks. And the idea is, how much data would you need if you were to train a circuit that was generated from background knowledge versus a CNN, which has no background knowledge except the data? And how stable or robust what you learn? So in this experiment, what we did is, actually, before I show the table, if you look here, there's two types of noise. There is horizontal noise, like paired pixels that are horizontal and paired pixels that are vertical. So what we did is we trained on one type of noise and tested on another type to see what happens. And what you'll see is the CNN actually pretty much fell apart when it was trained on one type of noise and was tested on the other. And this circuit that included the background knowledge actually was very sturdy. It's almost maintained its performance. Uh, because it actually knows what it's looking at. And that's an example of training with background knowledge. You can be very uh, robust in these cases. And in fact, this, this was for the rectangles. Uh, another experiment for digits uh, was trying to see how much data do you need. And, and you can see in this case, with very few images, uh, relatively speaking, I can get very high accuracies. Uh, you need a lot more data for the neural network. In fact, eventually they catch up. Right, but the point is, with very little data, you can get performance. Of course, I mean it makes sense, right? Because you have data plus knowledge. You know a lot about what you're trying to do. Uh, by the way, this was the model for the rectangle. There is another model in these citations for the digits, which is more extensive. Uh, the numbers I showed you very recent. In fact, they're still under review, but I wanted to share them with you. But the underlying technology that enabled these experiments is in a paper that's already on the archive which is a new algorithm for compiling circuits with background knowledge and actually compiles them into uh, tensor graphs so they can be trained efficiently like you do with in neural uh, networks. So I guess in this part, the, the, the message is 
there are approaches for both supervised and unsupervised learning that can take both knowledge uh, expressed as at least logical constraints and data and learn from them. And we're seeing the benefit of that, which is typically what you would expect and what people want, except that we don't have a lot of very, you know, major approaches that actually do that, where you can reduce your reliance on data and get things that are uh, more robust and, and so on. All right, so this basically concludes the second part of the tutorial. And in the last part, uh, we have less than 20 minutes. I want to get to the uh, last component. This is very recent and concerns the use of these circuits and tractable circuit to reason about the behavior of uh, machine learning systems. And the idea is we will compile these systems into circuits that capture their input output behavior and then let me just get to it and show you the first concrete example of how this works. And then uh, we'll see how much we will be able to cover in the remaining 15 minutes or so. Uh, this is pretty exciting. This is all the last couple of years. A lot of new development. And most of the references are just this year or last year. So this is one of your simplest machine learning systems, which is um, an IU based classifier, right? So you have the features. You observe them, you compute the probability on the class, you check against the threshold, and then you make a decision. The interesting thing about this and many other machine learning systems is that even though they're numeric and even though they were learned from data, they do specify discrete functions. Uh, in this case, uh, the uh, urine, blood, and scanning are discrete variables. The decision at the end is actually yes, no which means I can capture this input-output behavior of this function symbolically. In fact, the very first approach we did for this uh, compiled these naive base classifiers into OBTDs, uh, decision graphs. So you give me an instance, I can simply render a decision and the compilation algorithm guarantees that any decision that is rendered by this symbolic representation is equivalent to the decision that will be rendered by this symbolic representation. This was the very first step. Actually, this work is very old. And then there was no attention to that until recently when people start looking into explainable AI. So the big picture here is, fine, you can do it for naive Bayes. What other systems can you compile? And uh, is it just this OBDD? No, you can actually compile it to other type of circuits. And, and the key thing is, what do you actually do or what can you do with these symbolic representations? So I'll, I'll try to answer as many of these as we go on, but this is basically the, the kind of more interesting part. And this compilation into OBDDs, as I said, this work was for naive is pretty old. Recently, we generalized this to both trees and then to general Bayesian networks. So we do have an approach that can compile an arbitrary Bayesian network classifier into an OBDD. And, and later I'll tell you about uh, random forest and neural networks. We compile this to a number of models out there in the literature. So this is uh, from uh, education, a uh, network for developed by some group in the Czech Republic. Uh, this is a network uh, from diagnosing problems when printing from Microsoft Research. This is a network that is for diagnosing breast cancer. It's actually from Stanford Medical Informatics. And, and what we notice is when you compile these classifiers in numeric classifiers into symbolic ones, the sizes vary. Sometimes they could be very small, sometimes they could be very large. And the size of the Bayesian network and its topology is not as indicative as we'd like to see. Uh, this particular guy here, for example, was compiled as into a relatively small decision graph, 156 nodes. And you're seeing the whole thing on the screen uh, without labels. But these results that we also reported on earlier uh, showed a big variance from you know few hundred nodes to few millions. And some people may see some of these numbers, they get concerned because when people talk about decision trees or graphs as being desirable, uh, they think of them because they're visually interpretable. Well, that's not our concern because I'll show you next. When you do explanations of decisions made by machine learning classifiers, we're gonna do this alg algorithmically. So we're not gonna be interpreting them visually. We are treating them just as practical circuits that facilitate computation. So whether it's 100 or a few million, doesn't matter for us. As long as you can store the circuit, you're good. And let me show you a couple of things of what you can do with these uh, things. The, the, the first thing that we did was explanation. 
And this is pretty interesting. It started one way and, and very recently there was really major developments on this front. So the first kind of explanation was very simple. You, you give me an instance and you say that this box rendered a decision on this instance. It classified it positively. And I, I tell you, why did you do that? So the first notion was this notion of a PI explanation. Uh, recently it's been called sufficient reasons in some of the works. I find a minimal set of the instance features that can trigger the decision. So, so if your instance has a hundred features and, and you decide it positively, I tell you why, you can go and bring me four of them and say these four. If you fix these four, my decision will stick. You can change the other 96 as you wish. It doesn't matter. It's these four guys that really made it. And you can take this idea further to do all kinds of other interesting things. But let's, let's illustrate with a concrete example. So in this particular case that we looked at before, I have Susan who tested positive for scanning blood and urine. And the decision made by this guy, which is also the navy based classifier, is yes, she's pregnant. And you say, why? Did you conclude that Susan's pregnant? And in this case, you come back because the scanning test came out positive. All right. So that means if you fix this, you can do whatever you want with these guys, and it actually does not matter. I will, you know, classify this as pregnant patient. Now, here's a more interesting example. Now, Sally, and she tested negative for all of these guys. And you say, why? And it turns out there are multiple sufficient reasons. And uh, it says because the scanning test was negative and one of the blood and the urine tests were negative. So scanning and blood is one sufficient reason. Scanning and urine is another sufficient reason. You can put these together in one Boolean expression, which is the disjunction of all of the sufficient reasons. And you can think of this as the most abstract formulation of why was the decision made on that particular instance. In fact, recently, in recent work, we gave a name for this Boolean expression. We call it the complete reason behind the decision. It is the uh, basically this junction of the sufficient reasons. And you're going to see how useful this notion is. But before I go further, I want to tell you that this notion of explanation or a sufficient reason is actually based on a very classical notion is this notion of prime implicants that comes from computer science. And you can think of these explanations as being prime implicants that are consistent with the instance. So typically when you have a particular function, you can basically go and try to see in what ways can I really make a trigger. So a minimal way, and here's the prime implicant says, if you set A to true and B to true, this function will trigger regardless of what you do with C. And this is another prime implicant and so on. And this notion of a sufficient reason is if you have an instance like this guy and you render this decision on it, and, and you can say, why did you do that? You simply look at the prime implicants that are compatible with the instance. So in this case, there's only two of them. And those would be your sufficient reasons. If, if you have a negative instance, the same thing, but you have to work with the complement of that function. And here are the prime implicants, which are minimal ways in which you can make this function trigger. And in this case, uh, there's only one of them that's compatible with this guy. So there is only one sufficient reason. This, these are basically the explanations in that case. Now, one of the main issues with prime implicants, as you know, there may be an exponential number of them. If I show you one or two, fine. But what if you have too many? And in fact, I'll show you now next uh, bias question. People are interested, are the decisions biased that you made? And you see that to decide bias, you may have to examine all of the sufficient reasons behind a decision. So this approach will not be feasible. And here's an example that illustrates this and tell you about a very recent development that actually is pretty interesting from this point of view. In this example application, what I have is classifier to decide whether to admit students based on their attributes. And here are their attributes, right? Whether they pass entrance exam, first time applicant, blah, blah, blah. The classifier was compiled into an OBDD, the input output behavior that you're seeing here, right? And you can say that it, a decision that is made by this classifier is biased if it can be different on an, another instance that's different only on protected features. So I give you one person, and I say, here's their attributes, and they do come from a home rich town. And you say, admit them. And then I give you another uh, applicant, exactly the same on the first few guys, but does not come from a rich hometown. And then you say, no, I'm not going to admit them. 
then that decision will be biased. You cannot change your mind simply because protected features have changed. And it turns out that if a decision is biased, if and only if each of its sufficient reasons contains at least one protected feature. So you can actually decide whether this holds by examining each of the sufficient reasons that a decision has. But in general, you can't do that because there's an infinite number of them. And interestingly, in recent work, we showed you don't have to. So here's an example of an applicant Robin, and she has all of these characteristics, and the specifier would say admit her. And then you say why, and you find out that you get five different sufficient reasons. And if I want to reason about is this decision biased or not, I have to examine them all, but it turns out you don't have to. You can actually obtain a circuit that captures the disjunction of these in linear time from the classifier, if it is an attractable circuit, in this case, an OBDD. It doesn't have to be an OBD. There are other circuit types that allow that. So you give me the classifier as a circuit and the instance, and in linear time, I can give you a circuit that captures all of the sufficient reasons behind that decision. We call this a reason circuit. And guess what? That circuit is monotone. It's well-behaved. You can do things like existential quantification on it in linear time. And it happens that existential quantification is the query you need to check bias, to check whether a certain decision was biased. In this case, you can see the protective feature appear in some, but not all of them. So the actual decision is not biased. And you can determine that efficiently by operating on the reason circuit without actually having to generate these uh, prime applicants. So this is very recent work. This paper actually will appear this summer, but it's already on the archive. And you'll see many more results there. That shows you how much you can do if you capture the input-output behavior of your machine learning system as a Boolean circuit and a tractable one in particular. All right, so folks, I'm running out of time here. I will skip this. Uh, this is basically, you can do that further things with these symbolic representations, like check the monotonicity of your classifier. We've showed this in earlier work and had interesting studies on that. I just, to wrap up here, I want to say that when we started this, we did work on explanations, but then we extended it to doing robustness and verification. And we started initially with uh, promising graphical models, but recently we extended to random forest and neural networks, a very special type of neural networks. And then initially we were compiling into OBDDs, but now we basically compile into different types of circuits as well. So here you see the big picture. I will have to just flash some of these slides and, and go directly to the end to finish. And you can see the pointers in the, in the paper, but uh, you can talk about robustness. You can define uh, instance robustness, whether a decision is robust versus whether the model is robust. And in this case, you can see how we could build uh, robustness plots for uh, CNNs that were compiled. You can compile uh, neural networks uh, with uh, binary inputs and step activation. This is what we focused on. I'm going to skip that. I'm just going to mention one last thing here. Uh, the compilation of random forest conceptually is the simpler of the Bayesian network and neural network because they're pretty much almost symbolic. Even when you have tests like this, these are Boolean tests, actually. And this paper that will appear soon uh, shows how you can actually encode random forests, but then once you encode them, you just compile and move on. And let me say conceptually, the hardest really is Bayesian networks. And these are easier to encode because in random forests and neural networks, there's no reasoning. There's just forward propagation. In Bayesian networks, between the model and the classifier sits a reasoning process. So conceptually, this is harder. And between these two, of course, the easier is this guy because it's basically symbolic. Let me wrap up this part here by saying that this notion that I can apply logic not to model the world, but to model what I've learned about the world is pretty powerful. And, and the theme here is that we want to reason about what was learned. And this idea of capturing behaviors of machine learning systems symbolically is broader than what I discussed. I talked about compiling into circuits, but there is a new community now, VNN community, that do, does this and do not necessarily solve these problems by compilation to circuit. They apply SMT solvers, SAT solvers, and they can scale more 
but they can give you less because SAT is NP, so I can give you that much. And, and in, in circuits, you scale less, but you get more, and hopefully the scalability will get better. I'll, I'll point you to this recent paper, actually, uh, which uh, argues for even architecting neural network in a certain way to facilitate this business of reasoning about their behavior symbolically and, and shows experiments that you can do this without compromising the performance of these things. So I'm, I'm basically done here. I, I had to skip a few things that I would have liked to talk about, but I think we covered a lot. And the paper that goes with this tutorial has all of the detailed references, so please check it out. And thank you, everyone. You fail. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Anand. <laughs> thank you very much, indeed, for the, for the excellent talk. Oh, excellent. Hello, everyone. <laughs> We, we had to turn the camera off because the battery was draining. Yeah, the battery issue, right. So, okay. um, Anand, um, actually, we got uh, two questions here. Okay, so I think there is uh, one yep. here, which is, yeah. I think, from Dan, uh, about explanations. How are the typical problem applicants in practice? If the classification problem has, say, 20 variables, then is it typical to have two, three, or more? Very good question, Dan. Uh, it, it actually varies. It actually varies. And in, in some of these, you get a very small number of prime implicants. And in others, you get a lot. And uh, it's interesting, as I showed now, it, there's two values for the prime implicants or for the explanations. One is because you want to see them individually, uh, because they represent portions of your instance that are sufficient to trigger your decision. But another reason to use these explanations is what I showed you like when you're doing things like bias, where I'm not interested in them per se, but I'm interested in their properties. <clears throat> for example, does a protected feature appear in each one of them? And for that, you don't care about their count. This uh, reason circuit notion uh, can actually capture them all efficiently and allow you to answer questions about them without enumerating them. I, I think that's a breakthrough, the, the fact that we can actually capture all of them in this notion of a reason circuit. Uh, but actually, you can play with some of some of our systems. I have, uh, we, I put a link. Uh, you, you can try it and see how many prime implicates you're getting. Do you know of complexity computation results for problems such as marginal partition function or cases when the model contains elements of commonly used continuous distributions? Ah, okay, no, okay. So, so uh, continuous distributions is not my <laughs> area. I, I really don't know immediately. Uh, for the discrete case, very well understood, all characterized, and, and you'll find in the past paper all of these uh, uh, complex results. So I, I really don't know about the continuous. Let me see what other question. Can Boolean circuits be extended to handle continuous distribution? What's the semantic of uh, if exist of such circuits? Now, I, I have to tell you, I, I did um, skip quickly over the probabilistic circuits part. And in those, people actually use continuous distributions as inputs. It, it really does not change things pretty much at all in terms of computations, but it does extend your reach quite a bit. So you can actually couple these with uh, continuous distributions that feed the input to your circuits. And um, that's pretty common, actually, in, in when, especially when learning these circuits from, from data. And finally, why did you name smooth circuit smooth? What was the genesis? Uh, so smooth, I felt that if you look at the, the children, when they all have the same children, when they're smooth, you don't have roughness. Okay, it was a while back. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Okay, so may maybe we have time for one more question. Actually, I, I do have one. Um, let's see. Oh, oh, we do have one here already. So I'll save mine. So, uh, Anand, could you go ahead, uh, take a look at the uh, Q&A okay. box again? So there's uh, one from uh, Mikhail Monet. So, thank you. Okay, I have a sort of model. I, I need uh, to compute sufficient reasons. I have two choices. You just use brute force to test all potential sufficient reasons and compile the model into tractable circuit and then solve the data. However, the complexity of compiling the model into a circuit is sharply hard, so why would I choose two over one? Well, it's the usual thing. Yes, every, I mean, everything that any one of us does is hard in general. Uh, we hope to do better in the average case. So. Uh, yes, in the worst case, you may fail. You may not be able to compile. And in fact, I'll tell you even a related question. People say, why do I want to compile into circuits? Why don't I just run a SAT solver? And that's even more efficient. Yes, it is more efficient. But as I said, you get less. All right? 
So the, the queries that I mentioned about robustness and the explanations, certain versions of them, they're not reachable, right? Uh, you're doing SAT, you're with an NP. Uh, you do circuit compilations with the right properties, you go beyond the NP. And, and that's the usual trade-off, right? Uh, uh, circuits give you more power, that, but they're going to trail behind in terms of other things. And we, we're hoping, guys, I, I think, let me end with this. If, if, the bottleneck of all of this is this notion of compilation. In fact, you see in the POTS paper, I, I had to feature that in the last section about future outlook. Calling on the community to have more people working on this subject of taking Boolean formulas and compiling them to circuits with the right properties because the benefit is so great. We, we have taken so much and, and squeezed it into the simple computational task, very purely symbolic computer science beyond AI. And I think the more people that work and make advances on compiling Boolean formulas to tractable circuits of the right type, the more progress we will make. And um, uh, I think uh, I will just uh, probably show you, I, I didn't end with the, the reference to the uh, YouTube channel. Uh, part of the effort to disseminate information about this and get more people involved, I, I started this, you know, our group YouTube channel and you find actually some of the tutorials there are dedicated for the channel. I, I just put them there to uh, help people catch up on things. One of them is a tutorial on building knowledge compilers. And uh, you'd see in the POTS paper a number of pointers to uh, open source code, some from my group. And please work on compiling Boolean formula to circuits with the right properties. It's worth it. All right. It, it, it's, it, it's good for the community. <laughs> Okay. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Anand. So uh, usually we would clap here, but it uh, looks like this is going to be well, difficult and weird. <laughs> All right. So um, once again, thank, thank you, you very much more. for the inspiring talk. Um, thank you very much. I hope you are not. All right. All right. Okay. I'll, I'll so thank, thank you, everybody, you everyone again. for coming to the tutorial. Um, so this is the end of this session. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Anand. All right. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye.